all for joining us today. I, it's been about two and a half years that I've been acquainted with the INBRI program, and it's been a great association. In my work at uh, Bridger Care, which is formerly Bridger Clinic, we have the wonderful opportunity to work with INBRI interns the last three years. And um, through that, I've become acquainted with the INBRI staff and Cafe Scientifique, and so today's a, a great day to be able to um, sort of bring many of my worlds together and introduce um, Annabelle and Isabel, our speakers, for tonight. Um, Annabelle and Isabel are known very well in the cystic fibrosis community as um, advocates for education and awareness and also organ donation and transplant. I met them only recently and have been very happy to introduce them to you. Um, both are graduates of Stanford University and I see at least two Stanford grads here today. Um, thanks for joining us. And after Stanford University, these are two, two women with chronic illness, which is difficult to live with as a young adult. They each pursued graduate education and continue to work in healthcare. Um, and um, Annabelle is a genetic counselor. Isabel is a social worker in bereavement counseling with children. So there's a lot of their lives that they have to share with us. And I'm happy that you are here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. to get cholera 
Um, so that gene is propagated through evolution. However, if you get two copies of the gene in recessive inheritance, <coughs> one from mom, one from dad, then that person will have cystic fibrosis, and that's a life-threatening disease. So it was very rare that my mother, being Japanese, is a carrier. And we've learned a lot in that process how much culture influences the chronic illness experience. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little background about cystic fibrosis. May I just ask how many of you are familiar with the disease? Ooh. So quite a few. That's great. Um, working in genetics, I've come across hundreds and hundreds of different genetic diseases. And I personally feel that CF is very well uh, advertised, if you will, um, and that, that it's well served. There's many wonderful organizations like the Cody D. Ruffin Organization Foundation and you know, the San Francisco Bay Area, we have a number of nonprofits for cystic fibrosis. So, you know, I, I personally, you know, given all the other alternatives that I've witnessed in my practice, that I'm, I'm grateful to have CF um, and, and in, a, in a very ironic way. Um, so, like I said, it's a recessive genetic disease. It happens in about 1 in 3,200 people. There's about 30,000 Americans affected with this disease. So it's rare, but not too rare. We still get a lot of exposure, and there's a lot of research being done on cystic fibrosis to try to find a cure, um, and so it's well served in that regard. I would just say that also, if we ask the question, how many of you are familiar with CF 20 years ago, I bet it would be just a handful. So it was really thanks to the scientific advancements, the media, and also the nonprofit Cystic Fibrosis <coughs> Foundation and um, other small groups around the country that have really enhanced the awareness of this and great. Yeah. So cystic fibrosis is a progressive life-threatening disease. Um, there's a genetic mutation on chromosome 7 and that uh, gene is, is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator gene and what that is is a chloride channel and a chloride channel is a little tunnel if you will that sits on the cell membrane and it opens and closes and allows water and salt to get through cells and when there's a genetic mutation then that channel or that tunnel does not work properly, water and salt don't transport through the cell properly, and it, the end result is thick mucus. Um, it's not a very pretty disease, um, but thick mucus is in many organs, lungs primarily, leading to congestion in the lungs, which leads to pneumonia, um, and ultimately lung failure. Um, also in the pancreas, we have a lot of mucus, and that clogs the digestive tract of the, uh, the uh, where the enzymes excrete from the pancreas to digest food, so we don't digest food properly. And then we also have uh, thick mucus in our sinuses, and so some people have very bad sinusitis, sinus disease. Um, again, we were, and in males, the vas deferens, um, which is the, the tube that allows semen to exit the body, is clogged with mucus as well. So 98% of men with cystic fibrosis are infertile. Um, so basically any organ system or any part of your body that has mucus will be affected. Also the skin, which uh, sweats, the sweat glands are also affected. People with cystic fibrosis have extremely high sweat content in their, in their salt content, sorry, high salt content in their sweat and that leads to um, really easy heat prostration and heat stroke. So we have to be careful when it's too hot. Um, I consider cystic fibrosis like a prototype disease. The gene was discovered in 1989, and since then there has been a lot more understanding about the process of gene discovery to therapeutics. And just last month, a new drug for cystic fibrosis was released that uses this new technology of understanding the genetics of CF to make a drug that actually fixes one of the mutations that cause CF and has the closest thing to a cure that they've come across so far. Um, in the cystic fibrosis gene, there's about 1,800 different mutations. So 1,800 different ways that the gene can be changed to cause the disease. Um, it's kind of like a pearl necklace. You think of 1,800 pearls, and each pearl can be rearranged or missing, or extra pearl can be inserted. And in CF, there's 1,800 different ways. And therefore, there's a huge variety or variability in the disease. Some people are very sick from the beginning of life, and some people don't get diagnosed until the 30s, 40s, or even 50s. So you see a, a wide spectrum of CF. It's a very high maintenance disease. There's a lot of medical care involved. 
Um, I think Isabel will talk more about that. But it really is a disease that, um, you know, it, it affects psychologically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, and of course physically. Um, diseases don't, you know, chronic disease, ch chronic childhood disease doesn't occur in a vacuum, and it certainly is, a, is a, an interesting life experience. Um, and like I said, cystic fibrosis has really been kind of a prototype for other disease models to, to follow. You know, our community, our cystic fibrosis community, there's 30,000 of us in this country, but we are so connected, and we know people in every state that we can share, like we call ourselves sisters and brothers, um, because, because it's like, are you my fried brother? Um, so some of you thought of that word from cystic fibrosis. Um, but uh, we really have the same lifestyle. I consider it a culture. You know, it's a way of living, it's a way of speaking, it's a way of what's in your medicine closet and how do you live, how do you wash your hands all the time, you know, all, the, all these different lifestyle things that we share, no matter if we live in Bozeman, or if we live in Japan, or if we live in San Francisco, or anywhere else. It's CF is a really binding community. Um, and also, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has had a very um, novel um, way of promoting research. They have paired up with venture capitalists and pharmaceutical companies. Most nonprofits for, for diseases raise money and they send that to families or they send that to researchers at academic institutions. But the CF Foundation did a little bit different and they started to branch out to the pharmaceutical companies and ask them, look, we'll, we'll get venture capital to fund you if you can find us a medicine quickly. And you know how capitalism works in this country. It think, think, pushes things ahead. So again, that became a prototype for a lot of other organizations to start raising money for their diseases as well. And funding research as well. Yes. So, okay, where do I start now? <laughs> okay, so basically, um, I just want to share a little bit about the key aspects to living with CF. And yes, we talked about the gene and we talked about um, the, the uh, thick mucus, but what allowed us to be 40 years old are the treatments that we started at an early age. We inhaled in usually some sort of saline or bronchodilator to open the airways. We started doing that when we were about five years old. Um, first we did it twice a day, then three times a day, and four times a day. And then during our adolescence when our health was really not very good, we would wake up in the middle of the night and do a fifth treatment. So after inhaling some of the mist, we would pound each other like that and I could get all my anger out on my sister. <laughs> and we as twins kept each other alive that way. We were able to separate from our parents, which a lot of young adults with CF are unable to do, and go away to college and take care of each other. Um, but in the literature, there are many other factors, of course, that play a role in um, helping people survive. First of all, you can imagine as a young adult, having to do these treatments is a real drag. And so in our community, there is a challenge with compliance, just like there is in the diabetic community and HIV and so on. It's hard to keep up with the treatments. The other issue is access to care. You know, we need health insurance and we need state and private health insurance for those of us who have various, you know, support systems and needs. And we also need, um, you know, about, well, I'll add to that and say that on average, our, our routine medical care which includes the antibiotics, the inhalations, the treatment, the machines that we use, on average is about $75,000 a year. And that does not include hospital stays and intravenous antibiotics. So this is a very expensive disease. And we're representing all of the young people with childhood chronic diseases that are living into adulthood that need good health insurance to keep um, growing, into, um, growing up. So, um, and then also there has been other studies that show that exposure to tobacco, well that obviously harms lung capacity. Maternal education as a psychosocial <coughs> issue is key in helping families raise healthier children. Um, that's a topic in and of itself. And, and, and then um, attitude, exercise, all of these lifestyle factors play a role. And when we like, look at illness as a science, I think that science is an art. And we can, we can never say A leads to B. 
Um, the scientists in the room know that here. <laughs> but there's so many factors that play a role in, in living well with an illness um, that uh, we can really, I'm not going to focus on this much today. But. Um, so, and, and I just want to say that um, above all in our community in the last 20 years especially, what has given our community uh, a drive to fight this disease is hope. Hope, which is not you know, easily studied, it's not really scientific, but it gets us through the treatments, it gets us through the next hospitalization, and the, the lower lung function after a pulmonary function test, and all of those very difficult moments, well, we have hope that there's gonna be a new treatment, or we have hope in lung transplantation, which we'll talk about next. So um, I do want to jump towards the rest of our life. Well, we lived with this disease, and it was very difficult. But as we grew up, we, um, we were in and out of the hospital with uh, various lung infections from the age of five. So you know, even by the time we were 18, we were in the hospital a total of 36 weeks each. So in and out two weeks, in and out two weeks for these IV antibiotic courses. And so the hospital became like our second home. And every hospitalization was a lung infection. And each passing lung infection was lung damage. And the more lung damage, the lower your lung capacity. Um, and so by the time we were in our mid to early 20s, um, our lung capacity was in the 50 or 40 range. And also I'll let Anna share a little bit about her story, what it was like to live with very limited lung capacity. And, I think we were talking this morning with somebody um, about how awesome it was to walk, you know, off the airplane and come to a restaurant and sit down and say, wait, what's the altitude here? And not even think about it because from the age of 12, I could never go to high altitude. And it's pretty remarkable to just be here and uh, not think about breathing. So you can show your tips here. So I'll just give a little background. So as I mentioned, cystic fibrosis is progressive and there is deterioration in lung capacity with age. Um, by the time I was about 23, my lung capacity was about 30% of normal. So it's about a third of your lung. Um, so imagine taking a straw and breathing through that straw and imagine like running with that or going upstairs with that. It's very, very challenging. With that limited lung capacity comes limited energy um, limited, you know, spending more time on treatments, more time in the hospital. Um, and so I was, we're very fortunate to have a type of genetic disease where you can take out the sick part and put in a new one through transplantation. Um, and so I was offered a lung transplant when my lung capacity was about 30%. To me, it was meant I failed, you know, that I did something wrong, I didn't take care of myself well enough, and I am at the end stage of this disease, it's going to win. And it was a failure to me, and it took me a long time to psychologically grasp that failure, um, and, and that it wasn't my fault, and that you know, even though we were identical twins, her disease was much milder, mine was much more severe. Why is that? Environmental factors, who knows? Um, but I, after, after 16 months on the transplant waiting list, I received a double lung transplant in June of 2000. Um, being on a transplant list is a gift. Um, not everyone qualifies for a lung transplant. You have to go through a very rigorous evaluation process. Um, you have to wait and survive that wait, and that can be the most challenging because there's a limited number of organs to go around. So after 16 months, I got a call saying lungs were available for me. At that point in time, I was very limited physically, um, didn't do much. I was on oxygen permanently and walked maybe three blocks before I was so exhausted. Um, and, and so I embraced that opportunity and embraced that gift of life and had a surgery that was nine hours long. Um, for lung transplant at Stanford, they cut this way. And it's a very interesting process. They cut this way, they pull the rib cage up and they pull the lungs out under. Um, and then I received the lungs of a 29-year-old man from Oregon who had passed away suddenly from a brain aneurysm. Um, he was declared brain dead. His family was offered donation. They said yes at a time of immense personal tragedy. They thought of other people. And I got his lungs. And from the moment I woke up, I knew somebody died and I need to embrace these lungs and live the best life I can with them. Um, ironically, my hospitalization for lung transplant was the shortest hospital stay of my life, only nine days. 
And I went home and started living with these new lungs. No more coughing, no more mucus, no more hours and hours of treatments, no more pounding on the chest. Um, by 10 weeks, I rode a bicycle for 10 miles. By three months, my lung capacity was about 80%. It, it takes a while to get back up because they shrivel up when they get removed from the donor. So it was a, a little bit of a rehabilitation process, but absolutely no regrets. It's been just an incredible, positive experience for us, for me. Yes, Anna was my role model. <laughs> and so I followed her three and a half years later. I kind of attribute it because I have a wonderful husband and he took great care of me. And maybe that's why I didn't need a transplant as soon as Anna did. I don't know. But maybe we're not really identical. Who knows? <laughs> we used to be. Now we're not because we have different lungs. <laughs> but in 2003, I was also, um, well, it's interesting. It's identical twins. Some people, when they need a transplant, their disease just progresses really slowly. And they sort of realize they're going downhill. And for me, my disease was progressing, and then it just hit rock bottom very, very quickly, and I don't know why. Um, and so even though I knew I needed a transplant, I had a lot of denial. I thought, oh, I'm strong. I'm still going to jazzercise. I can, you know, do things and uh, enjoy life. But when you're sick all your life, your mind just gets confused about what is quality of life. And I thought I had a great quality of life, even though I slept 12 hours a day or 14 hours a day sometimes. Um, and so I sort of plummeted in my health and went into lung failure and was put on a ventilator. And this all happened about two weeks after I was placed on the waiting list. Um, and so thank God, I mean, for I was really, truly graced because some family out there in the middle of California said yes to organ donation just at the very end of my life. And um, so I was saved, and I just want to emphasize one organ, doesn't just, one organ donor doesn't just save one person. They save the family, and they save the entire community, and the entire just network of people that are touched by this, this one gift. Um, and so, yes, same thing, three months later, I rode 10 miles, I was trying to catch up with her and get strong again, and we've been incredibly fortunate um, so since then, we really both have jumped into the deep end of getting involved with organ donation and MCF um, because when we've survived, and while so many others haven't, we feel like it's a calling for us to speak up and share this experience and speak for those on behalf of those who cannot. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that we're not normal. <laughs> I think we're, we're, you know that already. We're not normal anyway, but. Um, we do take medications morning and night, um, about uh, 15 medications in the um, pills in the morning and night, and we're immunosuppressed forever. I mean, we'll never get off of these meds, so we have to be very careful about infection, and uh, we have a cough radar. If someone's coughing, we want to back away, and um, just have to live our life very vigilantly. I used to be a medical social worker. I used to work in a hospital at the bedside, and now I do not. Um, ironically, I found that bereavement care was something that worked for me. I could be with the parents after the child's death outside of the hospital. So we just have to be a little pickier about how we can work and be safe and be healthy. And I work in genetic counseling in a prenatal setting, which is in the obstetrics clinic where there's pregnant women. So again, I chose that area of genetic counseling to avoid being in a, a, a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. And then um, we are both diabetic. We both have, um, because of the side effects of the medication and our damaged pancreas is we're diabetic, but the side effect of the transport meds also cause um, osteoporosis and high blood pressure and uh, uh, what else? Um, Rejection, high cholesterol, and, and cancer. She just finished chemotherapy. And it sounds awful, but really, like, we're really healthy. I mean, we're the healthiest <laughs> <in our> entire <laughs> life. <laughs> and um, so it's all relative, right? And um, I started to play the bagpipes after transplant. It's the best, um, best thing I've ever done. My lung capacity went from 95% to 120%. So that is the gift of Xavier Cervantes. This young man gave me the ability to play pipes so that the world can hear his lungs. 
So um, that's one of the just um, mm -hmm. best things I've done. So I'd like to transition now um, to transplantation as an issue, as a cause. And um, I don't want to sound too much like we're pushing anything, but we'll tell you about the history of transplantation and then share the need. And then, um, you know, if you have any interest or other uh, questions, we can open that up later. But um, basically, I want to share a personal story. In 1954, uh, Dr. Joseph, sorry, I'm having a, a moment, one of those 40 moments, Joseph Murray, Murray thank you. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Murray performed the first kidney transplant in the, in the world, the first organ transplant in the world, and it was between two identical twins. And he did not have to provide any kind of immunosuppression because they were genetically identical. And I was able to meet Dr. Murray uh, just a few months ago at his house, where he opened his closet and showed me his Nobel Prize. And so this is one clinical doctor who received a Nobel Prize for the most worthy of reasons, and he started transplantation. Um, of course, they attempted transplantation across, across um, unrelated people and even across species. Initially, it didn't work because the immune system would just suddenly uh, you know, explode and, and, and target the foreign organ and reject. Um, and it wasn't until the late 70s, early 80s that two drugs were developed. Cyclosporin, which is from a mold, as well as tacrolimus, which is from a mold that was found in Japan, um, that allowed transplantation to be more successful. And the first lung transplant, I should say the first heart-lung transplant occurred in 1981 by our, ours truly, our surgeon, Dr. Bruce Wright, at Stanford. And then in 1983, the first double lung transplant, just the two lungs, were performed with Dr. Joel Cooper in um, Toronto. So that's a little bit of history. Um, I'm going through this very quickly. And then in the 80s, they realized this is really going to be a, a major medical breakthrough for end stage organ disease across the board. And so UNOS was developed in United Network of Organ Sharing in order to create a fair and efficient system of organ allocation um, that United States was really the hallmark of creating this for to model to have all the other countries model after that. So, um, cur cur you know, just a little background. If one donor, you can become an organ donor three ways. You can um, be a deceased, brain dead donor. You can be a living donor, or you can be a deceased, death after sorry, donation after circulatory death donor. So that means well. I'll go into each of them. Brain death. I mean, a lot of people think about brain death. They don't really know what it means. It's not coma. It is not persistent vegetative state. It means a complete and utter cessation of brain activity. The circulation to the brain, the blood flow is gone, and the brain stem is dead. And the brain stem controls breathing and blinking and reflexes and all that. And when you have a major head trauma, about 60% you know, of donors have head trauma, um, that because of an, um, inflammation of the brain, you can become brain dead, and there's very little that the medical community can do to stop it. Um, and so brain death, they test that by something, you know, putting a Q-tip on your eyeball, and if you blink, that means you still have your reflexes, or putting cold water in your ear, and if you um, sort of get, show some visual signs, that that's a reflex again, if you, um, they, they do all kinds of things, um, EEG, gas reflex, and EEGs, and so on. So it's there um, in our in our due to the UNOS. There's all kinds of rules that you have to have two separate neurologists determine brain death, and they have to be completely separate from the transplant team, so that there's no conflict of interest. Um, and so the other way is living donation, kidney donation. You can donate part of your liver and as well as nowadays part of your lung. You can give a, a lobe of your lung to a, a young or small person, depending on size. And of course, that means that the person who gives the, the, the piece of the organ or the kidney is still living. Yes. It's, it's not a deceased donor. Right. It can even be a living heart donor, believe it or not. Uh, we've heard that where we've had a friend who um, basically it's called a domino transplant, where she had bad lungs and she received a heart lung transplant because it's easier to donate the block and she donated her healthy heart to someone else. 
Very bizarre, very rare. Yeah, <laughs> to hear your own heart in someone else's life. Yeah. <laughs> and those are the things that are possible. And then lastly is donation after circulatory death, which for some reason is unusual in our country. We, I mean, on average between, I would say, 5 to 20% of organ donors are don um, DCD donors. And what that means is somebody has a traumatic brain injury, and there's no chance of recovery or life but they're not brain dead. They still have some brainstem function. But usually, DCD is only, only happens when the family asks the doctor, can my loved one be an organ donor? Can we make sense of this tragedy? This was her wish. And so they, when everything is consented, the patient is brought to the OR, and the life support is removed, and there's an amount of time, usually 60 minutes, that the patient circulation needs to stop, the heart needs to stop. And if the patient doesn't stop, doesn't die, then all donation efforts are, are immediately ceased and become, this um, palliative care is offered. But usually the patient stops, uh, the, the heart stops, and then the organ recovery will happen. So, and unfortunately, organs like the lungs, which need lots of oxygen, don't usually um, survive DCD, so it's usually just the kidneys and sometimes the liver that are good for donation after DCD. And again, donation of the circula after a circulatory death is only for people who are imminently going to die anyway. Yes, yes. And so each deceased donor, either way, um, can donate up to eight organs. Um, and the average is about three, because if there's a car accident or something, usually some of the other organs are damaged. It's very difficult to preserve the lungs, especially when a person is on a ventilator, um, the lungs get, you know, can get bacteria or you know, infection and so on. Um, but there's all kinds of initiatives to try to help preserve lungs. And, um, and then usually if one donor can d um, donate up to 50 tissues. I don't want to forget the miracle of tissue donation that people can see and people can run and people can, um, you know, recover from the burn because of donation of, of tissues. And people always ask, oh, I'm too old to be a donor. But really, there's no age limit. It's really case by case, because as you can imagine, there's always 50-year-olds that have the body of an 80-year-old, and vice versa. Um, so it's really up to the medical team to decide who's an adequate donor. As we've gone around the country, the biggest myth that we encounter is people say, oh, I'm not a donor. You know, I have cancer. Oh, I'm not a donor, I'm too old. Oh, I have this chronic condition. People rule themselves out, which is a major um, concern because that's not necessarily true. It's sort of a belief that you're not, at, you're not you don't qualify when in fact you could. Um, so I, I want to just add that of all the deaths that occur every single day, only 1% of deaths are brain dead, brain death deaths. So the majority of people who die cannot be brain, cannot be organ donors. It's a very small, small percentage of people. And of the people who consent to organ donation, sometimes they can't be donors. Maybe they, they do an infectious disease workup. They do all kinds of tests on this, this person as they're getting ready to donate. And there's, there may be something that rules them out. Maybe they have hepatitis C. Maybe they have HIV and they can't be a donor. Um, and about 60% of all brain dead donors are males, and unfortunately that's because of the increased risk of accidents and head trauma from accidents. Um, both of us receive male organs. We wrote our donor families thank you cards or thank you letters about a, a year after our transplants. Most, we, that letter goes to the California Transplant Donor Network. They scratch out all identifying information. They forward it on to the family, if the family wishes. Some families don't want to hear from their recipients. It's too painful. Our families receive the letters. And then for me, six years later, I got a letter back saying, I want to meet you. And that was a real surprise, because it had been six years. Um, and hers was two years later, and they wrote back. Ironically, we got their letter on the same weekend, which is so <laughs> weird. Uh, her donor was from Central California, mine was from Oregon. Um, and so we had the very rare opportunity of meeting our donor families. Most recipients don't have that. Um, but what, uh, what can you say to somebody who saved your life? Um, it, it's a very, very emotional process of, of meeting a family that's faced a loss and given life to others so selfish, selflessly um, and so unconditionally. 
Um, it's a real, I, I really believe donor families are the highest form of humanity that exists. Um, so currently, there's about 113,000 Americans waiting for organs. Um, but there's about 1,500, or sorry, about 2,500 people waiting for lungs. Um, about 80,000 are waiting for kidneys. Kidneys are the most high demand. Um, every 11 minutes, a new name is added to the transplant waiting list. And in America, we have this wonderful infrastructure that allows regions to have wait lists um, and organs to be uh, to, you know, allocated safely and efficiently and um, equity, equally to different regions. And every day, nonetheless, um, people die waiting for organs because there's not enough to go around. About 18 people die a day waiting for organs. So to us, this is a public health issue. Um, of course, it's tertiary medicine. It's extremely privileged to have an organ when you're talking about immunizations and you know basic needs like food and shelter. We feel kind of I feel kind of shameful talking about organ donation, but at the same time, you know it is a good thing. It's a way to love each other. You know we we receive loans from a Hispanic person and a Caucasian person, and you know we all share the same blood and we all share our humanity and our gift of life to other people we don't know. It doesn't matter if my donor is a, you know, black, white, Republican, Democrat. It's a way of shedding all of that and just become one as humanity and giving gift to, the gift to other people. And every year in the United States, there's about 14,000 donors. Um, so it's, it sounds like a lot, but with 113,000 people waiting, it doesn't meet the need. And so that's why people die every day. And in America right now, we only have about 40% of people nationwide that are signed up to be to organ donors. <laughs> Even though many people believe that it's a good thing and they feel it's a right thing, they haven't taken that extra step. And why is that? Well, I think there's a lot of personal myths and beliefs that we have about death. If we make, if we do advanced care planning, if we write a will, if we list our wishes, then we might die, that, that there's that concern. My donor actually told his mother uh, two months before his car accident, if anything ever happens to me, I want to be an organ donor. I don't know why that happened, it just did, but she knew. She knew to say yes for his um, wish. I also think a lot of people, and sort of going on a tangent here, um, they have some biases about people on the list. Um, oh, those people didn't take care of themselves, they're alcoholics, they're overweight, they're smokers. <laughs> Well, if the people really look at the UNOS website, United, Nation, sorry, United Network of Organ um, Sharing, um, you can see a breakdown of the candidates who need transplants and their causes of, of illness. And yes, obesity is a major epidemic, and yes, diabetes leads to kidney failure. That's a major problem. But the majority of people we've met in the community are people who are just really unlucky. I mean, we met a person who had salad at a restaurant and contracted horrible fulminant liver failure. Hepatitis A. Probably from hepatitis A. And um, someone who, you know, tried mushrooms or, or, you know, there's just stuff that happens. Babies that are born sick. And um, there's all kinds of stories out there. And um, it's, that's the beauty of the, organ, the donors that do choose, the families that do choose to donate is that they don't, really care who receives the organs because they're extending the life of that person on the left. Um, so as you can see, because we receive this gift of life, we feel some sort of obligation to give back to the community. And we wrote our memoir not so much to like be all self-centered and everything, but it's more just to share with the world what living with cystic fibrosis is like. Um, and, and really for the lay audience to, to maybe take a second look at their own health and, and what it's like to breathe every single day freely and easily. And like I said earlier, our book led to a film. Our film led us, uh, our, our book led to a Japanese book tour. Um, and then we saw the conditions in Japan where people weren't getting organ transplants because it's very taboo, it's very controversial. <laughs> In the U.S., we can't figure out when life begins, so abortion's a big deal. In Japan, they can't figure out when life ends, so donation is as big of a deal as abortion is here, believe it or not. There are anti-organ donation groups in Japan. So we realized that, and then we saw the conditions of the cystic fibrosis patients in Japan. Japan is a wealthy, industrialized country, high-tech country. Those kids are dying in their teens. They're like 12 years old. That's, you know, that doesn't make sense. 
So that led us to, you know, wanting to pursue helping these families and being kind of advocates. And so really this is a journey from being very sick, receiving so much love and compassion, education, um, opportunity, receiving even a better gift of life, and then try to do something with it and, and really live every day fully and live for our donors. So I'll just conclude here by saying that we tried to cover science, we talked about our lives, but I want to end on a spiritual note. And that is, you know, spirit cannot be measured, it cannot be proven, it's pure belief, but organ donation is a spiritual act. And when I was dying and I had hours to live, the stars were aligned, and I believe that things happened in a miraculous way, in a way that cannot be, you know, evaluated, but something happened where I was given this gift. And, um, and that's the gift of donation, and that helping others, the gift of compassion to help others in need, is a common human value, and that's why all major religions support organ donation except for the Japanese religion of Shinto, which is really small, I guess. It's not really a major religion. I can say that I'm Japanese. Um, but um, <laughs> anyway, I, my point is that uh, I just personally see the translation from the science of, of organ donation, of cystic fibrosis medicine, to the spirit, the spiritual um, <coughs> blessing that we have received. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now is your chance to ask questions of our speakers. So, fire away. Yes. As a genetic counselor, if you're counseling people and then they find out that their um, fetus has cystic fibrosis, some not everybody chooses life. And I mean, how does that affect you personally in that professional role? Um, I went into genetic counseling and went through a master's degree training program um, to learn how to be a genetic counselor. And it's really a profession of non-directiveness, non-judgmentalism. So um, regardless of the condition, people make choices. Um, and for cystic fibrosis, because the prognosis is so much better today than it was 10 years ago, fortunately many people continue the pregnancy. But I have had several families that didn't. Um, obviously, I never tell them I have CF. Um, I, luckily, I'm in the wrong race, <laughs> so it's not very obvious. Um, and it's really such a personal choice for them. And I have to respect what they know of themselves and their resilience and their personal resources and their ability to envision life with a chronically ill child. Um, it's not easy, you know, certainly I. You know, I go home and get frustrated, for sure. I and mean, we have people who end pregnancies with cleft lip in Northern California. So there's all kinds of frustrations in my job. But um, it's about being non-judgmental, open-minded, and allowing people to choose the kind of life they want. Yes. Because you still carry that genetic defect, is it possible that these lungs you carry can become infected and, and eventually fail as well. That question is asked at every single one of our events, so thank you for being the one to bring that up. And um, no, our, our lungs are genetically separate and genetically unique. Mine are from a Mexican-American man and hers, well right now we're not sure exactly what race, but they are distinctly genetically belonging to that other person and they will never change. The CF gene in the rest of my body will not enter these lungs. And so we will always have CF in our sinuses and in our intestine and our, our pancreas, but not in our lungs. And that's, you know, for the most case, most transplants are like that. I mean, there's one lung disease that possibly can re-enter the lungs. It's called LAM. Myomatosis, and um, that's really difficult. That's very tragic for some of the transplant recipients, but it's very rare. Uh, just, I failed to mention earlier that I actually had two double lung transplants. Um, I went into rejection six years after my first transplant, um, and rejection is a process where the immune system attacks the lungs. It was very quick, 
very unstoppable, um, and it felt like a, an asthma attack that came on and never went away. Um, and so from, in eight months, I went from 100% lung capacity to 16% lung capacity, and was back in a wheelchair, back on oxygen, and the same story without the thick mucus, um, suffocation, basically. Um, and I was offered a second lung transplant. Thankfully, Northern California has a high rate of consent to organ donation, so they have more organs available than average. And I was offered a second and had a second lung transplant. I wrote my donor family, thank you, um, and I never heard back. So that's what she means by not knowing about my second, because I don't know anything about that person, only that they're male. Have, have you had your DNA sequence to find out exactly what mutation you have and whether, for example, this new drug that only helps certain people might help you? Yes, we have. Actually, in um, 1994, we lived in Japan for a year, and the Japanese doctor was quite excited about us being his patients, and so he tested our blood and sent it off to labs, I think, probably in the U.S. Um, our father is from Germany, and so we have Delta F508, which is the most common genetic um, mutation in Europeans. About 60 to 70 percent of CF patients have that. And then my mother has something called R347H, which is a relatively common mutation, and we don't know why she had it. Maybe the Russians and the Japanese did something. <laughs> but she does not like to hear that because she's of samurai blood. <laughs> but then my mother actually has two mutations on her chromosome. We have a 979A double mutant allele. So that explains, that explains <laughs> because if you look at the literature, Delta 508 and R347H combination tend to be mild disease. Mm. Ours was not mild. I was born with bowel obstruction. That's a classic sign of classic CF and started the, the downward spiral from there. So I think that extra mutation um, pushed us over the edge. Um, my mother also has some CF symptoms. She's always had problems digesting fat. She's had sinus surgery. Um, she's had colon cancer, which is another issue in CF. That's what I just got, too. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and, and I just want to share, my grandmother was alive until a few years ago, and so she had her blood tested. My grand, Japanese grandfather died uh, in World War II. And, um, and he had 11 brothers and sisters, and seven of them died. And so we will never really know, because lots of babies died of diarrhea and pneumonia back in those days. And my grandmother was not a carrier. So she said, I knew it was from his side of the family. <laughs> That's usually what people say when genetic diseases are in the picture. But we will never know if he and someone in his family have, have this disease. Yeah. Not he, but. So the answer to your question, no, we will not benefit from that new drug, yes. But we benefit enough. <laughs> uh, so if you have cystic fibrosis, uh, is your objective then to get a transplant? Is that, or is it to live as long as you can with the disease? And you, it seems like you're kind of gambling that when you get sick, that you'll find somebody that you will get a transplant. That's a very, very important and good question. Um, so lung transplantation is the riskiest of all organ transplants. Only 50% of lung transplant recipients survive five years. So you are taking a huge gamble. And the idea is to wait till you're so end stage disease that there's no other option. Usually um, you can't get listed for lung transplant until the doctors, even though they're not God, but they estimate you have about a two year survival. So you need to be that sick. You need to be quite advanced and have significant lung, con lung damage and significant impairment in quality of life. And also, um, for many people, lung transplant is like trading one disease for another. Not everyone is as fortunate as we are. Um, there are people who get cancer. There are people who get, um, like well, <laughs> mine's different. Um, <laughs> you know, there's people who get post-transplant lymphoma, which is a very serious problem 
or people whose lungs never really take and they never get the lung capacity that we do. Lung transplantation is hard on the body. It is like getting hit by a car and then walking and get up, not getting up again. And not everyone has the physical stamina or the genetics or the mental. mental stamina to deal with it. And so for some people, it is very hard. And there are many lung transplant recipients who re remain on disability. They can never go back to work. So when you think about that, gamble, it's, it's a gamble. The idea with cystic fibrosis is keep your own native lungs as healthy as possible with all the current available treatments. Let's hope and pray for new, better treatments, gene therapy maybe even someday, um, to keep people with cystic fibrosis healthy as they are so they don't need lung transplants. And my hope over the young generation is that transplantation will become obsolete and that something else will cure the disease. We have encountered teenagers who are so angry at having to deal with all of the disease, all the treatment, that sometimes they just say, forget this, I want to just get a transplant. Well, ironically, you're not eligible for a transplant unless you're extremely compliant with your medical care. So some of those teenagers find themselves in a very difficult spot where they're on, they have end-stage disease, they are going to die, and they do not qualify. So the key for young families and the difficulty for parents these days is to try to encourage kids who generally feel okay to do several hours of treatments a day for the long haul. I guess I was trying to understand about your mother when you were talking about her two mutations. So, so does that mean if she had both mutations, she has a mild CF? Or I didn't quite understand that. So there's two chromosomes. You get one from your mom and one from your dad. My dad had Delta 508 over here. My mom's chromosome had two mutations on the same chromosome. The same so she herself technically has one chromosome that's normal. So she doesn't really have CF. This is pure speculation. We've just observed in her, we've just observed mild CF-like <laughs> symptoms in her. And there is lots of literature that says some people who carry certain variations in the CF gene can have what's called monosymptomatic CF, mild cases of pancreatitis or you know, um, sinusitis or, or issues like that, for infertility, et cetera. Does California routinely screen all infants for CF? So since 2007, okay. following the model of Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado, California finally got its act together <laughs> and started screening for CF universally in all newborns. Today, far, <coughs> five years ago, 40% of new cases of CF in California are Hispanic. So we're picking up a whole new cohort of ethnic group that was dismissed before. Oh, you're not white, you can't have CF. But it's not true. You see it in every race, it's just less common. My grandniece happened to live in Colorado, so she was lucky she was diagnosed right after birth. Right. You know, and so they've had treatments all the time. <laughs> My, my sister, Cindy, who was the grandmother of this child, said that she has met families where the parents are in denial and the kids are not receiving the treatment that they really need. And uh, it upsets her, but you know, she can't do anything about it and it tries to encourage them, but it's like their kid doesn't have it. You know, and so the kids are suffering, you know, which is really that's, hard. That's what I meant when I said earlier, this is a yeah. disease that affects psychologically, right. emotionally, financially, right. everyone in the family. And, um, you know, I attribute our survival to my parents. I attribute, you know, parents have to do so much. Right. It's not a disease that's just passive. It's a very active disease, and so uh, personal coping is a huge factor. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I understand or uh, read about, at least generally, that the survival of CF patients in Europe is, is better than in the United States, uh, largely as a result of the aggressive treatment. In the U.S. getting better, or uh, are we still having trouble? Right, so just anecdotally, 20 years ago, we had a friend from Norway come <laughs> to America, and she had CF. And she, when you develop a certain level of lung disease, you can culture certain bacteria. And she cultured the most common bacteria in CF, which is Pseudomonas. And in Norway, the minute they culture Pseudomonas, they're on a routine of every three months, IV by antibiotics through a port, a little device in the chest. And so now she's 43 and mother of two children, slightly overweight, working. I mean, this is a model of health. That was 20 years ago. 
I would say in the last three to five years, really, America finally got their act together and realized, oh, maybe Scandinavia is doing something good and preventing a severe infection. Because America, you know, the U.S. system always was afraid of multi-resistant bacteria. If you treat, you treat bacteria with antibiotics aggressively, then we don't want these superbugs, which we're getting anyway. But um, so little by little, the system is changing, thanks to the advocacy work of the CF Foundation. All patients, not that they all do, but all patients are required to go to CF clinic every three months, get a speedo culture. Um, but we're still, because of our private insurance system, we're still a disease-based, you know, medical care. We have disease-based medical care. So literally, insurance won't pay for an IV tune-up. We call an IV, of course, of IV antibiotics a tune-up, unless there's a drop in lung function, unless there's ma major clinical symptoms. So that's our problem in our system that's really difficult to change, is how do we do preventative care in, and, and convince the insurance per, suppliers that we're actually going to be cheaper in the long run if we are treated proactively and preventatively rather than ultimately paying for a $600,000 lung transplant. And we were trying to do some advocacy work in Japan where they had no CF drugs and the, the companies had national health care. But they had national health care. Um, but the companies would not take polmazine, or the, the government would not approve polmazine, which is a very good drug that loosens the mucus, it makes it watery, so you can cough it out easier. Um, they would not approve that, and they would not approve an inhaled antibiotic called tobramycin, which has been clinically proven to increase lung function, because they're too expensive. Um, and so, and, and then, you know, the stories we heard about the Japanese CF patients, if, if you want a private room, you have to pay $300 a night. Well, when you have a respiratory infection, do you really want to be in a room with 15 other people who have a respiratory infection? No. And when you're doing all this all night long, who wants to be in your room? So the, the situation with their national health care system was, was very eye-opening for us, that even though we have limitations compared to Europe, we still have it pretty good here, too. So I think we're in the, in the middle range, or in the upper middle range, in terms of world statistics for survival. Way in the back. Yeah. Um, I'm a school nurse, and I'm just curious what it was like for the first 18 years growing up until you worked with the school system and, um, and your disease. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, academics was very important to us as a wonderful distraction and a coping mechanism and a way to show that even though our body just didn't work, our minds did. So we needed as much support as possible from the school system because starting at the age of 10, we were absent from school quite a lot. Um, fortunately, we had family support. My father would tutor us in math and science, and we would call our friends every single day and get the homework assignment. And uh, we didn't want to rely on the system. We didn't have IEPs. We didn't, we didn't know about that stuff. Um, and so we just, and we're also Japanese, and like that's our culture is to just manage by yourself. Don't get extra help. Don't burden people. Don't burden people, right. And so we, we manage. But I know plenty of other CF families who definitely need the support of the school. And when we were younger, we did go to the office to take our pills. And then we decided we didn't like to do that. And so we would take our pills and not tell anyone. Or we wouldn't take our pills. And so that's just the nature of growing up. Um, and then our high school uh, school administrator was very accommodating where they would let us park. Um, my brother would park in this teacher's lot, which is close to this classroom, and we would go into the car once a day to do a treatment. During recess. During recess. And likewise, in junior high, my dad would come to our junior high school with the car and do treatments in the middle of the day. So there were all kinds of ways. We had like um, take-home tests that my mom and dad could supervise us taking them. And we just tried to do everything else everyone else did. And uh, we didn't want to be spoiled or excused from anything. We wanted to be challenged. We wanted to be um, in with everybody else. We, we did try work with the system once, um, and it wasn't a very positive experience. We were put in a class of developmentally disabled people. Um, and, and given like eight, well, two plus two equals what, you know, kind of thing. And so that was in seventh grade. In seventh grade. And so that was very insulting, and we kind of became very independent from there. 
I remember um, I was in eighth grade, I was absent for nine weeks straight to a point where when I came back, people said, are you new? Um, and I brought a stack of homework this big to the teacher and they were just surprised that I had all that. Um, but that's kind of our compulsivity um, and that's what really helped us in the long run academically. Yeah, I mean, any child with an illness or condition just wants to be normal. So we were going to prove in every way possible that we were normal. Uh, I was just curious what it was like uh, <coughs> when Francis Collins discovered the CTFR gene for you personally as well as for the community. And That's a great question. So Francis Collins, who's now the head of the NIH, National Institute of Health, he's he, also in our film. Yes. <laughs> you guys can see him tomorrow. Don't give away too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, he, he discovered the CF gene in 1989, and we were at CF summer camp when it happened. And there became an announcement, everyone come to the assembly area, and all the kids came, and they said they just discovered the CF gene. And all of us, like, cheered, and some people cried, and we're like, the cure is coming, the cure is coming, and, you know, oh my gosh, maybe there won't be camp anymore. And then everyone got really sad. <laughs> and said, you will not have to grow up with this disease. Because by the time we were 17, 19, we had like 50% lung capacity. We were pretty far gone lung-wise. But there was so much hope for the young generation. But then the years passed, and the science became more and more complicated, more and more difficult, and various gene therapy trials didn't go well. And it was a really difficult time of anger, frustration, impatience and pure desperation. And um, you know, we salute the researchers out there because I know they're doing their best and you know, working very, very hard. And I mean, even the day that the new drug was um, announced a couple months ago, this uh, VX770 drug, uh, the day before that, my friend died and she had that mutation. So every day matters. And it's that's the difficulty that we're still waiting for that magic bullet that will help more than just 5%. The VX770 drug is only for 5% of the CF patients, but it's a stepping stone to the next. Um, so we were excited, and um, you'll have to come see our film because there's a little segment in there about how it affected other people. <laughs> you mentioned how many people are waiting for a transplant and that you know there are only so many people who sign up to be donors. And, and are there, I think there are some cultures where people are, they, they're automatically considered to be donors unless they opt out. And so in your advocacy work, are you doing anything along that line to try and have that happen in the U.S.? That's a good question. I'll let her answer that because she's on the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm, on the, I'm not the board, but I served on some, several committees, including the Ethics Committee for United Network and And um, so that's called presumed consent, opt out, where everybody's a donor, and if you don't want to be a donor, you opt yourself out. And in all the countries that do earn a donation, about half of them have opt out, and half of them have opt in. And um, like Belgium and parts of different kinds of European countries, mostly European, but believe it or not, I think Malaysia, places you'd never expect are actually opt out. But um, truthfully, both in the network that we've talked to in America and personally, I don't think that will ever happen in America. We are American. We are independent. We don't want the government to make us do something. Obviously, the government's not making you do anything, even if you're in an opt-out situation, because you have the choice to opt out. But people perceive it like that, and people freak out about any kind of rule that we're all in. And so it's just not the American way. And there are groups in New York that are heavily lobbying that to happen in New York, because in New York, only 10% of people are signed up. So maybe if they become an opt-out state, then it will help that state. Um, mostly because of the ethnic diversity in that New York. Um, as well as other administrative problems. So um, we're, we're not really doing any advocacy for that. And um, I really appreciate there's a lot of experimentation around the world with trying to promote policies to enhance organ donation um, just by will, because 
when you choose to be a donor, there's the honor, there's the respect, the valor of the act that donor families really thrive off of and need to heal through their grief. And if everyone's a donor, I'm not sure how that would change that, that sort of personal um, impact. And, um, oh, Israel, for example, has this great system, I think, eye for an eye, right? So if, if you're not signed up for to be a donor, you can't receive an organ. <laughs> and isn't that just fair? <laughs> encounter. Basically, if you have African American, Native American, or Hispanic blood, sometimes you're more likely for kidney failure, more likely for hypertension, diabetes, and you'll just need transplant. But in America, only about 40%, 35% of the donors are ethnic minority. Registered donors. Yeah. Registered donors. Oh, no, actual donors. And that's what's not fair. That's the discrepancy that we want to encourage organ donation education in the minority communities. We're doing our small part in the Asian community that has lots of stigma against it. But um, you know, that's why people of color who receive organs need to become their own spokespeople. I mean, sort of, that's my belief. I'm curious about, you said that your chronic illness had spiritual impact. And I think about you as adolescents, and you said that was a really hard time. Can you talk a little bit more about what that was like to feel like you could die and, and have that you know, real um, fear, maybe, and how you dealt with that? Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the gifts, believe it or not, of having cystic fibrosis was that we learned about death early. And that means we needed to appreciate life. And I think we've packed more in in 40 years than we have if we lived to 80. And this sense of this is our last chance. We better go now. We better go to Bozeman. We better go to Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, going to, we're going to Yellowstone when most of the roads I hear are closed. But it doesn't matter because this could be our last chance and we need to go. Um, and my poor husband has to put up with this kind of mentality all the time, urgency. Um, but it, it's. You know, from, from childhood, we lost hospital mates, you know, down the hall who died of CF in the room next to us. And so from six, seven years old, it was a, a big wake-up call. Um, and we found that it's, quantity, it's quality of life, not quantity. And we learned at Cystic Fibrosis Summer Camp that a child could live 14 years but have the best time in their life at the CF camp. And that meant the most to them. That was their... their best memory. Mm -hmm. um, I think on the spiritual level, I was nine years old when I kind of made sense, wow, I'm going to die young. And my lungs started to really bother me, so I had anxiety. And I was nine years old when I asked for a Bible for Christmas. My parents are not religious. I mean, they grew up sort of forced to be religious, and then they gave it up. And um, I think I had a sense that I needed to know more. I needed to know what else was there besides this body. And um, and, you know, even spiritually speaking, after a transplant, like, I woke up in the ICU probably three days after. I was really out of it for the first couple of days. Morphine is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I remember having, the medications cause all kinds of strange side effects, including hallucinations. For me, I was having audio hallucinations, and I couldn't stop listening to Mexican music. <laughs> and, and someone saying, Papa, Papa, donde esta, donde esta, where are you, Dad? And it wouldn't, I could like shake my head and I would tell my husband, turn the radio off. And there was no radio playing. And I, at that moment I said, I think I have a Hispanic donor. <laughs> and I did. Two and a half years later I found out. And you hear stories like this all the time. And there have been studies on so-called cellular memory we will never understand that. We really won't. And then, you know, my donor's mother said, my donor's just, my, I mean, my son was just like you. He, he wanted to help people and he wanted to, you know, he, would, he was like a social worker even as a kid. He was trying to help other people. Um, just, and always busy, always doing lots of projects. And it's strange that it's like that. We don't know the mystery of it all. 
Um, so I'm just wondering uh, kind of what the impact of you guys both having it, if you guys think you'd be where you were without each other, or if that definitely made a difference in your life. Absolutely, we'd be dead <laughs> if we didn't have each other. Um, I think being born twins was the best blessing. For my mom, it was very difficult in the beginning, but it paid off, and we did our therapies for each other since age 12. Um, it relieved them quite a bit. And we were able to go away to college with our severe disease, being able to do this all the time for each other. Um, motivation, you know, if I didn't feel like doing a treatment, she was on me, you know. And if I wanted to cut my treatment short, we'd fight about it. You know, I did your treatment for 30 minutes, so you better do mine for 30 minutes. You know, and so that kind of survival mechanism um, really, really helped. One of the tragedies in the cystic fibrosis community in this generation is the overuse of antibiotics and the creation of resistant bacteria and superbugs um, that don't respond to medication and cause really severe disease quickly. And so since 1997, there's been kind of a, um, a, 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 what is it called, a policy to separate people with CF so they don't spread, so they don't their, spread their germs. And so all the camps have been shut down, all the um, social activities with CF patients have been shut down. It's become kind of an infectious disease in its own way. And that, to me, has been the greatest tragedy. Imagine being the only person on this earth that has this unique experience, and you're not allowed to be with the other person who has that. And, and, and it's and caused kind of like a social death. And this new generation is afraid to meet us, is afraid to meet, be in the same room or be in the same school because such a hysteria has developed about this. And it is a real issue, but it's also, you know, in my opinion, overblown a little bit. Um, and so there are many people who come to our book signings or come to our movies and they are 25 years old and they said, I've never met someone with CF before. And that's like being a woman and never meeting a woman before. Or being a man and never meeting a man before. Or being African American and never meeting an African American before. It's, it's a weird concept. And so that, that is a very sad part.